Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In his work, The Poetics, Aristotle is going to define tragedy for us, and in that definition, there's kind of an interesting clause, a part of that definition, which has to do with the function of tragedy, how it works upon us as spectators or as people who are uh, experiencing it, the effects of seeing a play enacted on a stage with actors and all of that. And what does Aristotle actually tell us about this? It has to do with our emotions, but not all of our emotions. He does talk about other emotions besides these two, but the two that he is particularly interested in are fear, phobos in Greek, and pity, eleos in Greek. And he tells us that tragedy part of what, what it is, part of what it does, its essence, is that through fear and pity, and the word through there is D, so you know, by the means of or through, it accomplishes purification, is usually how we translate this, catharsis, of those very emotions, of those pathe, those things that we experience, right, that, that then affectively drive us and uh, induce us to not just feeling, but sometimes thinking and acting. And purification here, Aristotle doesn't really explain what this is, but, you know, per, some people thought, well, it helps to empty us. It's a purgation of these emotions. Quite literally, it means like a cleaning. So perhaps it purifies those emotions. We'll leave that aside for the moment. And then we want to ask, and Aristotle answers this at many different points in the poetics. Okay, so through fear and pity, how are these produced within a dramatic production, a tragedy? And the first thing that he talks about is what we translate as uh, joint, so in relation to each other, uh, recognition, anagonorisis, right? And reversal, peripeteia, literally like changing uh, round, uh, falling, right? And so recognition is having known something before, but you know, then it being, you, being ignorant of it because of the circumstances, and suddenly you, you understand how things go. So for example, when a character who you think is your enemy is suddenly revealed to be your long lost friend, okay, well, there's a recognition. Or worse off, when uh, Oedipus finds out that he is the man who has caused the plague on the city of Thebes by killing his own father and marrying his own mother. Ooh, that's terrible. And that's also a, a reversal as well. So these cause, as Aristotle is going to say, um, pity and fear when they're, they're done well. A joint recognition and reversal will yield either pity or fear right? Depending on what the circumstances are. And we'll get into that in a bit. Why would it do one rather than the other? We go on a little bit further and we find that um, Aristotle is actually going to talk about two different things in a passage about how we produce these uh, sorts of things. Um, how do we generate um, 
the, the stuff. Well, the structure, the sustasis, this is the plot, right? And recognition and reversal are also part of the plot, the muthos, the most important element of tragedy. So the sustasis of events he is going to tell us um, is part of how we grasp the, these matters. And he talks about hearing events that happen without even seeing the play can arouse pity and fear in us. Now, what's he talking about there? We would actually say reading because in ancient times, um, when somebody would read, they would read aloud and they would often read aloud to other people. And so you would hear the play being read by somebody, right? But we would read it uh, with our eyes in our own time. So, you know, the way in which the plot is structured can help to produce these emotions in the, you know, the, the right kind of person. Some people are impervious to this sort of thing. And in that section, Aristotle is actually going to talk about um, not just the plot or the structure of events, but he's actually going to talk about um, spectacle. Opsis, which is one of the elements of tragedy, but Aristotle considers it to be the, the one that's the sixth of six in importance, right? And actually kind of, kind of falling outside of the poet's work. It's more something that another person would do. And he actually tells us that it has little to do with the poet's art and it requires material resources, Right, um, so it's it's not quite as involved. Um, and he says those who use spectacle to create an effect, uh, not only of the fearful, the things that strike fear into us, but also we could say of the uh, sensational or the monstrous, to tetraodes. Right. Um, so this he thinks it can work. Right. You can have a scary mask. Right, you can um, make scary music to go along with it, or the the stage could be all dark or something. You're down in Hades, but for the most part, this is not what Aristotle is interested in. Now, something that does pertain to the actors and the direction is what uh, gets translated as gestures, um, but we can see that it's not simply gestures but also um, something deeper than that. So gestures are, are schemata, right? Uh, he says, so far as possible, one should work the plot out in gestures because a natural affinity, uh, you know, apotes, outtes, fuseos, he says, makes people, uh, those in the grip of emotions, the most convincing, uh, so an actor who is actually feeling pity or fear uh, can convey those to us. Obviously, we're not talking about the hero in this case. We're talking about the other characters. For example, the chorus in Greek tragedies. Oh, whoa, you know, this is terrible. Uh, poor Oedipus, you know, or whoever else it's going to be, right? So that's part of it. Uh, but he's talking about how, um, well, he says the truest distress or anger, using these as examples, is conveyed by one who actually feels these things. Ale um, thino theta, right, is, is uh, the, the term that he brings up there. And he talks about, um, you know, this can happen with all the emotions. So the actors on stage, seeing how they're reacting, hearing how they're reacting, the, the gestures of their bodies can help us to feel pity and fear. And then finally, we have one last thing that he says can help us get pity and fear in this, and it's thought, which is the third most important element of tragedy, right? Thought, he says, um, covers all the effects which have to be created by speech, and he tells us what the different things are. One of these is the conveying of emotions, parascheuadzein, you know, sort of equipping uh, us with emotions, or the actors doing that. 
and it conveys it to us, the audience. So all of these are ways in which pity and fear can be aroused. He has two other really important things to um, tell us here. And uh, one of these has to do with um, what we actually, you know, are responding to in this. How do we, how do we find the events pitiable or fearful? Now, he's, he's thinking about a Greek audience here, so this might not completely apply to us. So he tells us this. Um, we shouldn't be showing decent people changing from prosperity to adversity. Um, why not? Because this is not fearful or pitiable, but instead repugnant, something that we find kind of gross, right? Um, so uh, mieron is, is the, the thing there. And what does he mean by a decent person? Epieke, so, you know, an average kind of uh, person who's okay, you know. And then he says, um, nor should we show the depraved changing from adversity to prosperity. This is the least tragic of all, right? It doesn't arouse uh, fellow feeling or pity or fear. As a matter of fact, it's likely to make us upset or dismayed or something along those lines. We don't want to see bad people prospering, right? And the fellow feeling there is philanthropon. Uh, so it's one of the few uses of that on, on Aristotle's part. So we've eliminated two cases. What about the rest? He says, nor should tragedy show the very wicked person, the sfodra poneron, right? Poneros is wicked, um, going from prosperity to adversity. Why? Because this might arouse fellow feeling. We might be like, oh, you know, too bad for him. But interestingly, what does Aristotle say? It doesn't arouse pity. We don't pity the terrible person for falling into bad circumstances, and we don't feel fear. Why not? Because pity is felt, as he says, for the undeserving victim of adversity, the things that are happening to them without there being good cause. If somebody is a really terrible person and bad things happen to them, we're like, well, you deserved it, buddy, right? And it doesn't arouse fear because we don't identify with the really bad person. And then he says, this leaves the person who is in between these sorts of cases. This is somebody who is not completely at the top of virtue and justice, but they do have some, right? Um, they fall into adversity, not through evil, or depravity, kakian or mokthirian. So kakian is actual vice, mokthirian is sort of a weakness, a softness, right? But why do they actually uh, fall into it? Uh, because they do something stupid, they make a mistake. And this is where we get the you know, fatal flaw theory, the hamartian. Hamartia can mean uh, flaw, error, sin, it's a very wide ranging word. But it, it conveys that the person isn't totally responsible for what they've done. And so Oedipus is a prime example of that. He also talks about theistes, right? So that is one set of things that do arouse pity and fear in us, the spectators. And then there's a little discussion later on where he says what sort of things, what sort of incidents strike us as terrible or you know, scary or as pitiable. And he says, you know, if we think about this, we got three different possibilities. These can occur between people who are connected by friendship of some sort, relationships, philia, or it could be enemies, right? Um, or it could be neither of these, people who don't really know each other, people who don't really care about each other. And he says that you know, it's not enemies that we're primarily concerned with in a tragedy, although there could be relations of, of enemies or rivalry, right? And it's not t people who are totally neutral to each other. It's within the matrix of relationships that uh, tragedy really occurs, right? He says, if an enemy acts towards an enemy, there's nothing pitiable in the deed 
or the prospect except for the sufferings. Tragedy must see cases where the sufferings occur within relationships, where one is about, it kills or is about to kill the other or commits some other such deed. And, you know, he goes on to say you can get these ideas from uh, Greek myths and legends. You can't mess with the story too much, uh, but you can, you know, introduce things that actually make it scary or pity provoking, right? So these are the, the things that Aristotle says about it. How does it actually produce catharsis? There's a lot of different theories out there, but Aristotle doesn't actually tell us. And so um, this is what we get. Pity and fear are the two main emotions that he's interested in. We might widen this and think about how are other emotions involved in these plots, in, in the way the actors act, in the, the spectacle, in the um, language that is being used, the thought, right? Um, all of this is, is uh, interesting and important and ties in with this ultimate goal of purifying, or however we want to understand catharsis, dealing with these emotions, not just within the play, but within ourselves.